Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Great Communicator Debate Series National Championship. My name is Tony Penny, and I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Before we get started with our national championship, I want to thank the many people who have made this national competition and this evening possible. As you may know, tonight's events are the culmination of a series of competitions from across the country. And although only two of our competitors happen, or only two of our competitions happened before COVID hit, we were able to transition our competition to online regional debates and created a meaningful opportunity for these debaters. So because of this competition, we brought together 16 of the most talented and brightest young communicators in the United States. But we wouldn't have been able to do that without the hard work, not only of our education team, who I wanna thank for all they've done over these past couple of months to make this program work, but also our regional partners. So I want to quickly acknowledge and thank our regional partners. Uh, so from Notre Dame High School in Los Angeles, California, Christina Phillips, Charles Donovan from Loyola Blakefield High School in Towson, Maryland, Kirsten Nash from Hendrickson High School in Pflugerville, Texas, brother John McGrory from Chaminade High School in Mineola, New York, Jerry Willard from Truman High School in Independence, Missouri, and our newest regional partner, Chris Igawa from Southridge High School in Beaverton, Oregon. In addition to our regional partners, I definitely want to thank all the debaters, the coaches, and the parents who supported their students through these. And I want to extend a special thanks to Dino Pape, the membership manager for the National Speech and Debate Association and head debate coach at Simpson College for all the hard work he's put into this competition. And finally, we want to give a big thanks to the Winsong Trust for their continued financial support of this program. So our mission in education here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute is to cultivate the next generation of thoughtful, informed, and engaged citizens and leaders to help develop the very sort of young leader you're gonna hear from in just a few minutes. President Reagan once said that since the very beginning of this country, democracy and education have gone hand in hand. Well, how do you teach students to embrace their roles as citizens? Well, speech and debate is, for my money, the very best activity a student can engage in to become a guardian of democracy. In order to do well in speech and debate, you have to know your history, you have to know your facts, you have to know your issues, and you have to be able to communicate about them effectively and impactfully. In fact, I think many of our politicians today could learn a thing or two by watching the students who participate in this program. President Reagan was known for his optimism, and if he were able to watch these students compete and communicate with their mastery of facts and the way they're able to disagree without demonizing one another, well, I think he'd be very optimistic for our future indeed. Throughout the day, our 16 finalists have been competing virtually, and now we're down to the final two. The stakes of this final round are significant. The winner of tonight's championship will receive a $5,000 college scholarship. First, our topic for our national championship this evening is this, resolved on balance, the philosophy of police departments must shift to better protect civil rights. Now, in just a minute, we're going to flip a coin to decide which side each student will represent. And I want to ask each of you, whether you're a judge or a member of the audience who's trying to determine the winner from your seat, wherever you might be in the world, I want you, just for the sake of this debate, I want you to put aside your personal opinion for the duration of this debate. We're not asking you to line up on the side you already agree with. Instead, we want you to listen to the way the argument is communicated. This is a contest determining the best debater, and it wouldn't be fair for your opinion to have a stake in the contest about communication. In fact, our students right now don't know which side they're going to debate. So we're going to flip the coin and they're going to figure out in a second. Those of us who work on a daily basis in the house the great communicator built know that there's a beauty, that there's a resonance, and there's a power in effective communication. And this is what I'm asking you to look for in tonight's competitors. And with that, I'd like to turn it over and welcome my colleague, Rebecca Harding, to the stage to introduce tonight's judges and start our final debate. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. We're going to be moving Tony into the audience because he will be serving as one of our final round judges today. Thanks you again, Tony. All right, I'm just going to quickly share my screen so I can introduce tonight's panelists. And if today is going like anything like we were doing earlier today, it is not going to allow me to share my screen. So you'll see their beautiful faces when they come on board in a little bit to be able to ask their questions. Um, but uh, thank you, Tony, again, 
Uh, it has been my honor to serve as the Associate Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Reagan Foundation over the past five years. And before I introduce our finalists, I just want to introduce uh, to our fantastic panel of final round judges that we have assembled from around the United States. We are extremely privileged to have with us here tonight our Chief Learning Officer of the Reagan Foundation uh, and Institute, Tony Penny, who you have already met. We are also joined tonight by Rachel Hoff. Rachel serves as the policy director at the Reagan Institute um, and our Washington DC based office. Um, she was the communications director and policy advisor for John McCain at the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, Ms. Hoff has conducted research and outreach for a number of think tanks in Washington, D.C., uh, including the American Enterprise Institute, the American Action Forum, and the Foreign Policy Initiative, an organization she helped found in 2009. Additionally, we are joined by Bob Gilbertson. Bob grew up in Kansas City, and he debated at Center High School under the legendary coach Wayne Brown. After graduating from Carleton College and the University of Michigan Law School, Bob moved to Minneapolis for 28 years. He has been a trial lawyer handling business disputes, products liability cases, patent infringement actions, and the other matters for clients like 3M, Cargill, and Tyson Foods. Additionally, we are joined by Nancy Fairbanks, who is our 2012 Great Communicator Debate Series alum. After graduating from the University of Texas at Dallas, Nancy pursued a master's degree at the universities of Oxford and Birmingham in the UK as a 2017 Marshall Scholar. Now at Harvard Law School, she is the founder of Dear Future Colleague, a nonprofit that supports the underrepresented students applying to graduate school and competitive scholarships. And lastly, we are joined by James Mismash. James is a two-time lead intern at the Reagan Foundation and a senior studying government and history at the University of Texas in Austin. He is a 2019 Normandy Scholar of World War II and Holocaust Studies and a 2020 Congressman Bill Archer Fellow in Washington, DC. He serves on the board of the Live Like Johnny organization uh, is a former budget fellow for Governor Greg Abbott and looks forward to studying and serving in the field of international diplomacy and security following graduation. And now I have the honor of introducing the 2020 Great Communicator Debate Series national finalist who has spent the day competing for this moment. We have one debater from the West Coast and one debater from the East Coast ready to battle it out. Our first competitor that I'm going to bring up here on screen is Caleb Knox from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Caleb, please join me on stage. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Caleb. Thank you. And for finalist number two, Anwesha uh, Merkaji from Portland, Oregon, will be joining us as well. Anwesha, please join me on stage. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. At this time, I'm going to flip the coin and determine which side of our debaters will take. So Caleb, I'm going to allow you to call the coin. What would you like to call? I'm gonna go heads. Okay. And I am going to flip a coin. I just got an iPhone. I have no idea how to use security, so we are just going to ask Google to flip a coin. Google, flip a coin. And it is tails. Anwesha, which side would you like to defend? Um, I'll take the affirmative, please. All right. So Anwesha will be de um, debating the affirmative while Caleb will be um, debating the negative. I'm now going to go off screen. Please make sure to keep time for yourselves as well as each other. And when it comes for moderator questions, I'll come back on screen to guide that section. And with that, let's go ahead with the final round of the 2020 Great Communicator National Championship. Good luck debaters. Thank you. All right, Caleb, are you ready to go? 
Yes, I am. Good luck. You as well. All right. I will pull up my case and begin time. And I will start time now. Five days ago, an innocent biker grabbing groceries in downtown Portland for his mom, just one last time before he goes off to college, was shot down with rubber pellets, slammed off his bike, and held in a van while photos were taken and no one tended to his wounds. He was taken by unmarked federal law enforcement officers with an unidentifiable vehicle, and there was no response. He is my friend, my classmate, and an innocent black teenager who wasn't even in Portland protesting. Quote, freedom must be fought for, protected and handed on, or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children what it was like in the United States where men were free, end quote. The namesake of this debate style itself, President Ronald Reagan himself had uttered those famous words. Yet, as I look to the status quo, I can't help but ask, have we ever truly seen a time where every man and woman is free? And if we can't free them, looking to today and recognizing the harms against marginalized voices using our prison system, will we instead spend our sunset years telling our children what it was like to hear a man be ignored when he says, I can't breathe, a man who was anything but free? From the core of this debate, we are addressing whether or not philosophy is part of the issue, not the entirety of the issue, because without a system to allow for it, the philosophy operates like a printer without ink. Nothing will actually change, but simply if the philosophy must change too. Unfortunately, this is easily provable by the simple fact that racial biases are embedded into the very basis of our police system. Arno Michaelis, a founding member of the largest racial skinhead organization in the world, as a reverence of the self-declared racial holy war, once taught white kids, quote, they were at war, that the white race was going to be wiped off planet Earth if they didn't fight back, end quote. Now a very reformed person and in fact a staunch advocate for Black Lives Matter with the Forgiveness Project, he explained of it, he was arrested for his daily riots and murder plots, quote, I was arrested many times. I spent a lot of weekends in jail. I never caught a case though because I was a white kid. Kid of color, black or Latino kid had done half the things I did, they'd still be in prison. And that's just how this country is, end quote. The year is 2020 and he's discussing actions beginning in 1985 for half his crimes, that's 35 years. Second, we can simply look to the chronological transgression of police philosophy and a past shift in philosophy that was in the wrong direction. Like humans who develop their beliefs all over the years, often having a very clean and simple idea of morality as children with simple issues to debate, they enter their formative years as a teenager and a young adult. And yeah, we're all bound to screw up here and there, it happens. But after a certain time, it really is time to reach adulthood before we truly lose our chance to have true moral standing. The Journal of Theoretical and Philosophical Criminology explained that in its early inception, leading up to the 1960s, police focused their efforts on maintaining order and providing service to communities. Later, their attention shifted to fighting crime and law enforcement to create a professional police force that was detached from the communities they policed. But soon a rhetoric was developed starting in the 1960s and really becoming globalized across the United States in the 1970s, those teenagers of the police. And that was the war on drugs rhetoric, which was weaponizing the criminal clause in the 13th Amendment for a new form of black enslavement, arrests. Brady Heiner, a black activist, explains that the criminal justice system has acted as a modern plantation where black folks dominate a new involuntary labor system. A wolf in sheep's clothing? That's still a wolf. It's when police became law enforcement rather than community advocates that we lost our protection of civil rights. It was when law enforcers associated blacks with the drug use and stealing, something that John Ehrlichman, chief advisor for Nixon, admitted was something rhetoric was lying about that we realized the wolf of racial targeting simply found a new disguise as a domesticated dog. 
This is why philosophy must change so that we can avoid freedom's extinction. It's time to fight for freedom and be able to tell our kids real stories of sunset where a time of everyone is free and no one worry of stealing their final breath. One moment, I'm just pulling my case up. All right. All right. So with that being said, is everyone ready to go? All right, then let us begin. When the video of George Floyd's death was released on May 25th, America's collective consciousness was pricked. Some took to the streets in protest, but all found themselves asking the same question. What should we then do? So beyond lofty rhetoric, today we join in the discussion. Let us ask how to best protect civil rights by asking what works? Where have we seen improvements in civil rights protections most clearly? And how can we help those most affected? The American people deserve these answers. And to do so, let us look at two separate examples to find them. In returning to the video of George Floyd, what rightfully horrified the nation about what they saw most formidably was how the officer acted in disdain toward Floyd, placing his knee on his neck for eight minutes and 47 seconds. Now this mute usage may seem like an isolated incident, but Tom Tyler of Yale School of Law suggests that this is the gaping hole in American law enforcement. Tyler works with a growing body of research that is suggesting that procedural form is what America needs most, not a system overhaul. You see, procedural reform reforms looks to the laws that govern how police are interacting with suspects and communities. This is often compared with substantive reform, which focuses on end results or distributive reform, which looks at how officers and resources are allocated. Now, procedural reform has been endorsed by the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing and by the Community Oriented Policing Services, and for good reason. It was a failure of procedural reform that enabled George Floyd's life to be lost, and it's a failure of procedural reform that is pushing Americans into protest. And only through a form of these procedures, through changing the way officers act with suspects, are Americans being able to climb out of these problems. Now, we can actually test this theory's validity to see if procedural reforms make a difference when they're put into place. After procedural reform came on the scene, many cities followed suit, and it's proven effective. We could take Las Vegas, which mandated a new procedural policy that in a foot chase, the officer leading would not be the first to lay hands on the subject suspect. This alone produced a 23% reduction in total use of force and an 11% reduction in officer injury. This policy is now being adopted across the nation, most notably in Dallas. For years, Dallas had a higher per capita rate of police-involved shooting than Chicago, New York, or LA. But in adopting similar procedural reforms, they found themselves on an uphill trend. Across America, police departments that shift to other are shifting to other procedural interactions, like banning chokeholds and strangle holds. And these places are experiencing a 22% reduction in the rate of police killings. From these successes, at least 20 other cities and municipalities have followed too. Now, Philip Goff, the CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, explains that the merit of procedural reform best when he said, I don't have to talk about race to reduce a racial disparity that has racial components to it. I had to change the foundational situation where police are chronically engaging with subsidies. Suspects. What Philip Goff understands here is that the way we get better results is through reforming the interactions that take us there. So let's now look to the second example of law enforcement strategies that is working to defend civil rights, predictive policing. Predictive policing is defined as the use of data analytics and information to inform forward-thinking crime prevention. In other words, using computers to predict where crime happens. By using more objective levels of analysis through data rather than flimsical and potentially discriminatory attitudes of officers, we can pinpoint where the problem is and can show less of an authoritarian presence. In the world of sports, this has proved to work. Humans can be biased and limited. So in baseball, the use of technology has allowed more objective ways of calling strikes, balls, and outs. Umpires will forever be part of the game, but the technology guides them. Beyond this predictive policy is leading to a comeback in American cities. New York University sociologist Patrick Sharkey writes about the decline of crime in the great comeback of American cities. Our current urban revival has stabilized neighborhoods and is helping them grow. 
Sharkey attributes the crime decrease to the use of predictive policing. This has reduced the response time and increased the chances of catching the perpetrators. With a sharp drop in shootings and murders, even in the most dangerous of neighborhoods, both Chicago and New York reported a decrease in murder from 2016 to 2017. And it's been so effective, they're expanding their program. Officials say that data-driven policing is responsible. And we can look to what is called the Boston Miracle, when crime dropped by 79% in the 1990s due to the use of predictive policing. But for millions of Americans, the ideas that we discuss are realities. They're terrified of two twin enemies, of the police that may mistreat them and the crime that can ruin an area. Now, I don't believe here anyone today claims to have the silver bullet, but through enacting more procedural reforms that build a healthier relationship to communities and enacting more predictive policing so that efforts can be specialized to communities that need it most, we can better protect civil rights and strengthen the communities that make up the least of us. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Are you ready for the four minute rebuttal speech? Yes, ma'am. All right. Begin time now. To be enraged at George Floyd almost functions as an understatement, but that question that my opponent raised, that Caleb stated, what should we do? rings true. But the question is also one of what dictates our understanding of what we ought to do. And that, in fact, is the very core of philosophy. The fact that police are in a position where their philosophy, their thoughts on what they ought to do, have led to constant forms of discrimination against African Americans in multiple different lenses of criminalization tells us there's an overlying issue. That isn't to deny the possibilities of procedural reform. In fact, a philosophical shift can occur in just about any form of reform, whether it's procedural reform or some kind of substantive reform or that entirety of defunding the police that we've heard people have advocated for. In fact, almost nothing that the negation provides to us is something that tells us we shouldn't believe in a philosophical shift because we can't get the ingredients right on what kinds of procedural reforms are necessary if we don't have a positive belief and core values that lead to an ethical understanding to treat all equally. Yes, we don't need to inherently include race in the conversation to solve some of these issues. But quite frankly, if African Americans use drugs at a rate that's six times lower than, or sorry, at the same rate as white Americans, but African Americans are arrested at a rate that's six times higher according to the Human Rights Watch, what we're seeing here is that race is inevitably part of the conversation. We can't deny it. Yes, Vegas did in fact see positivity with the foot chase, but what my opponent fails to recognize is that that on-site violence, that type of control, isn't completely nullified. And in fact, a lot of these empirics are rooted in this idea that the violence decreases when in fact it doesn't. Simply the arsenal of the types of violence change. There's a reason we've had so many conversations about the paramilitarization of police forces, where Project 1033 allows for passed on military weapons to be given to police, and police are incentivized to arrest. Part of the very philosophy is the fact that police get more money for arresting. And when we don't treat the philosophy with the implicit biases, we recognize that even programs like Stop and Frisk, which was supposed to be a positive procedural reform, led to more problems with the race question. The second point my opponent brings up is predictive policing. And this is where things get really problematic. First of all, facial recognition technology has been proven in multiple instances to have ambiguous results when it comes to people of color, especially with darker skin and especially black populations. Furthermore, in 78% of cases, Google's most developed facial recognition technology that they created in correspondence with IBM would classify African Americans and black populations with dark skin as gorillas. That's beyond dehumanizing. And it creates a labeling system in which we can't actually identify systems. LA's Pred poll that's used in New York and Chicago too actually uses earthquake models to predict crime. But earthquake models are based on this idea that crimes repeat in the same locations. Those geographical hotspots quote unquote reduced crime because they increased arrest rates. That's not a positive change. In fact, what we saw with predictive policing is that in Chicago, an SSL report reported that there was negligible change in terms of actually reporting changes in homicide and predicting homicides. Because the homicide predictions were 98% inaccurate for the only case study that exists today, according to Saunders in 2016, who has a PhD in criminology. 
And it's based on this idea that we couldn't truly identify how the data was being used and because the data is fed in by the same police with the same philosophy that creates those implicit racial biases in the first place. So for those reasons, we need a philosophical shift. Okay. All right. So with that said, are you ready to get started? All right, let us begin. So I want to start by looking at Anwisha and I start with the same assumption that there are major problems in law enforcement and that we need to solve them. But the question that I want to work through in this speech and that we're going to be working through the rest of the speech is how can we best solve them? Now, in our time that we've spent, Anwisha and I, the last two days at Zoom, one thing I've learned about her that we're both similar is we both love Hamilton. And to quote Hamilton, Anwisha, you strike me as a person who will never be satisfied. And what I mean by this is we're holding police to a standard that's unattainable. Consider this, there are 375 million interactions every year between law enforcement and individuals. A marginal amount of them lead to force. Most of them are, do not escalate. And 1% of 1% of those end in shootings. Now, these are problems we have to address, but we need to put them in their rightful context. So after we start with that base assumption, here's what I wanna ask of everyone. How do we see solutions, right? And I think this is really important because we can't know exactly what it's like to be in these communities, but imagine for a second that you live there. What is the best route? high and lofty rhetoric are real solutions that better these areas. And it's my proposition that we look for the solutions. And let's start with procedural reform. Take areas like Las Vegas, other parts of California and New York. What they did was they instituted procedural reform. So police could not put individuals in chokeholds like we saw in George Floyd. So that we had limits on when foot chases were happening, that the adrenaline of police officers did not get the best of them and escalate to shootings. And what did we see? We saw an increase in officer safety, an increase in the safety of suspects, and a decrease in crime. This is where civil rights are best protected, with reform. And now, this is just the beginning of procedural reform. We're seeing this move beyond, as 20 new cities have already committed to adding procedural reforms to the problem. And I think what's important to note is what we're doing is we're specifically pinpointing the problem to where it is. It's not the entire structure, but it's procedural reform that we need to change. But let's look at, secondly, how else do we actually see discrimination lessons? And it's predictive policing. And I think one point to note is that my opponent points out the problems with stop and frisk. And I think everyone should be against stop and frisk. But what helped end stop and frisk, at least in the way it was used? It was predictive policing. You see, before predictive policing, um, officers more had to use, they would, let's say they had 100 people that they were suspecting of a crime, 97% of those people, 97 of them had nothing on them. There was no evidence found. But with predictive policing, we can predict where the crimes are going to occur. And obviously the story is complicated, right? Anytime you're using technology, there's nuance involved. But I think I want to point out some new innovations. For instance, TDT Analytics have new technology that controls for race. This is what's now being adopted by new cities. So there's less of the discrimination we're seeing. And here's the most important thing that we look back to the sociologist who pointed out, why has there been a betterment of urban areas since the 1990s? Why are, there, why are lives getting better? And it's because in large part, obviously there's other variables, to the use of predictive policing. You see, this is because when officers don't have to use as much of an authoritarian presence, and are able to use more objective methods to fight crime, civil rights are better protected. And so I think when we look at these, we, on Wish and I, we completely agree on the problems, right? I think it's almost our American duty to, patriotically to look at where America is falling short. But the question is, how does this get better? How do, where do we go from here? And throwing our hands up and saying the system's corrupt isn't helpful. Instead, when we look to where we've seen real reform happen, and we've seen civil rights become better, I think that's the route America should protect. And to end with, as Ronald Reagan once said, and Christine Adams once forwarded me, no crisis is beyond the capacity of our people to solve. No challenge too great. We're Americans, we can do this. Let's follow the truth and see where we can find reform. Thank you. Amazing. All right, you prepared for cross-examination? Yes, ma'am, you wanna take the first question? That would be amazing. All right, begin. Uh, wait, one sec, I think we just got okay. it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. They, yeah. they were for the, yeah, my bad. Just the explanation again. All yeah, right. I'll begin. Absolutely. Now. Yeah. So 
I'll admit, I am in fact a person who will likely never be satisfied. And I love the Hamilton reference. But one of the things that comes with never being satisfied is perhaps me never being satisfied with predictive policing. And for me, that starts with the data. Can I ask you where the data comes from with predictive policing and if it's vetted at all? Right, so this is why um, the, the definition of AI is, is um, programming that codes itself. And what that means is even if, so there's this idea of dirty data, I'm assuming that's what you're getting at, that police officers can feed skewed data into the systems, which is a very real problem and I don't want to diminish. But the whole point of the objective use of technology is they vet the data and, are, and the more data that's feeded into it, the more they're able to direct it in a more objective level. Did that, uh, you have a question? Yeah, did that suffice? Yeah, so um, what I actually, I think uh, this is kind of an important discussion on the predictive policing. So when we see, um, because I, I agree with you that like there are certain, it, it's a complicated question, right? And there's a lot of variables to it. But when we're looking and we're seeing that predictive policing, like if we were able to see that this betters the lives of those in certain marginalized community, would you therefore be for predictive policing if we could see that it betters their lives? No, and because I don't buy that we will. To be blatantly honest, I'm not satisfied because if you look to predictive policing, Facial recognition technology has had a race problem for years now, and it has not been solved, and yet it's employed in mall surveillance already, and it has improved targeting of African Americans, which isn't something we want to see improve. Uh, if I look to the utilization of AI in terms of drug crimes, we can go to an Oakland 2016 study, which told us that the data fed in, and the only data they have that they can use, is the 2010 data on drug crimes. What's that telling them? To yet again associate this idea of Black populations with drugs, even though that's not accurate. And on top of that, AI data by nature is using predictions based on someone being socially associated with someone. So if I am by nature associated with someone who has a criminal record, I therefore am pertained to be criminal based on AI. So yeah, I honestly can never buy predictive policing as we've seen the tech that exists. Do okay. you want to continue there? Do you have a question? Uh, I do have a quick question. Mm -hmm. In terms of Vegas, was there any policy enacted in Vegas in regards to how they structured the police force at the same time? Sorry, can you, what do you mean by that? Was there maybe changes in the Vegas philosophy in terms of what the humans were forced to talk about? Did they have something like a fair and impartial policing class or anything else that also occurred? Yes, so Vegas actually had a series of reforms, but what's important to note is that the study I noted, so there's actually more numbers on the Vegas incident, but I was very careful. The numbers I referenced, the 23% decrease and the 11% decrease were attributable to the foot race um, reform. So I wasn't, I know, I know what you're referring to. I wasn't talking about those reforms at large. I was looking at the procedural reforms and how they indicated. Right. Oh, wait, well, that's three minutes. Okay. Yep. All right. All right, thank you debaters. I will say that any debate that brings in Hamilton references and weaves them in so nicely as both of you has done is a great debate in my book. Uh, we are gonna be moving on to our judge moderator questions. I'm going to bring our judges up from the audience one by one. They're going to be able to ask their questions. Both of you will be able to respond uh, and we'll get through all five of our judges before we move into closing statements. Tonight, we're gonna to start off with James Mismash. James, can you please join us on stage? Hi, sorry, a little bit of connectivity issues. Okay, so my question is for Caleb and feel free to respond, uh, both of you. You mentioned the quote where there's no crisis too big to solve. So is it your belief that um, a philosophical changing or shifting and policing is a crisis too big to solve. Sorry, what was the first quote you mentioned, the Reagan quote? Yes. Oh, no, what I was insinuating there is that um, when we look at it and try to say that, like, we can't solve this question, I think it's a solvable issue. But I think the way that we solve it is through this reform, is by pinpointing where the problem is, see where the evidence take us, and reform it on that level. Okay, and you don't... Do you think there's a philosophical component to any form of practical change? Well, yeah, I think, I think, you know, we're dealing with very complicated questions here, right? And there's a lot of variables we're looking at. But where the evidence led me was to say when we specify problems, reform them, that's how civil rights become benefited, not through abstracted philosophies. Thank you. Thank you. James, do you have a question for Anwesha? I do. I'm sorry. Uh, 
you Hamilton playing, wait for it. Sorry, right, there we go. And I had a little spinny thing. Um, you mentioned, uh, or my question to you is about kind of tied to Caleb's as well. It's how do you see that philosophy changing into policy in the practical matter? I just am wondering your thought on that kind of shift. Yeah, um, so I think one of the best examples I can actually give you is Las Vegas. Caleb does in fact isolate one procedural reform, but the notion that we can isolate reforms in regards to a lot of intersecting issues is a big problem. Because when we do look at Las Vegas, one of the biggest things they implemented as a procedural reform, and they did list it as a procedural reform as such, was creating a fair and impartial class that required at least four hours of training every month based on the idea of combating human biases and implicit biases and completely restructuring the police force as a result, using experts on the idea of racial bias to eliminate racial targeting to the best of their ability. And even so, there have been problems with that. And I think when we look at the war on drugs, it did actually end up eventually going through legal channels, but that didn't happen during the Nixon administration as much as we like to say it did. During the Nixon administration, one of the biggest things we really saw was really just a spreading of rhetoric and vilifying black populations to the public in a way that allowed for police philosophy to justify racial targeting. And that's where we saw the biggest issue. And that then constructed legal channels to do the same. Mr. Mismatch, do you mind if I briefly comment on that? I promise it won't be long. I'm going to have to shut up to Rebecca, but I'm fine with that personally. And thank you for your response on Twitter. Just super quick. Right ahead. Okay. Okay, so just super quickly, I took this into account, and that's why, as we point out in Crossfire, the data that I referenced is directly attributable to the reform, the procedural reform, not the overall changes. So I just think that's important. I bet I wasn't trying to conflate the data on that, that I, that I augmented the, the results with the specific procedure. All right, thank you. thank you. And thank you, James. We're going to move you back into the audience. Next, we are going to bring up Rachel Hoff to the stage. Rachel, please join us. Well, thank you both for a great debate so far. Um, looking forward to uh, hearing your answers to the rest of the questions. As for my own question, I have one for each of you. For Anwesha, maybe I'll start with you. As, as you. as you talk about adjusting uh, the philosophy toward protecting uh, the civil rights of the suspect in these in these cases where where police are involved. How do you think about how to balance that with kind of the underlying philosophy of law enforcement, which is protecting the public yeah. safety of of all citizens? So I think that's something that I go back to the journal quote I read in the first speech on theoretical policing and criminology which talks about the issue in which police philosophy has shifted significantly away from serving the public and the community and towards the law enforcement and maintaining order, where serving the public and protecting and serving in regards to public communities is far more important right now, especially when we look at the fact that by being detached from communities, we've been able to see a largely overwhelming silence of marginalized voices in which they aren't choosing to be silent, but instead they are silenced. And when we look at what philosophy changes, one of the first things I take to is accountability and even how that will construct changes in policy with things like qualified immunity. I look at, for example, the case with Breonna Taylor. The stand your ground law, her fourth amendment, so many different forms of civil rights were violated right there. And that was because pol police philosophy justifies this notion that it's arrest first, protect later as of right now. And that's what needs to reverse. Thank you. And, and Caleb, as you talk about shifting toward an emphasis on these new technologies like predictive policing, how do you think about where we should look to as a society? Who should we look to to be the arbiter of balancing those, those new technologies with, with our own civil rights? Man, it's such, a, it's such a good question, right? Because I think this is a broader question of like, where is technology going? Where is big data going? And I think that um, I actually did my senior project on this type of question, and what I found a lot of the evidence indicates is what we need to make sure we're comfortable with is as Simi Valley, or not Simi Valley, um, as we're seeing this kind of technological boom in America, we have to be willing to give the government the ability to regulate it simultaneously, right? Because no longer is, we always, like all of political theories built on this idea between the individual and the state, right, in that relationship. But now there's a new party. It's the individual, the state, 
and these massive technological firms. So what we need to be comfortable with is saying the government can regulate them as well. So it's more of a triangle. And I hope that's not too vague, but the, the idea I'm getting at is I think we need to be comfortable with the get government regulating them when necessary. Understood, thanks. I'm sure you meant Silicon Valley, but you'll never, uh, you'll never be, you'll never have a Simi Valley reference uh, counted against you. At least no one's watching. Foundation. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Rachel. We're gonna move you back into the audience. And next we are going to bring up Bob Gilbertson. Bob, can you please join us on stage? Uh, Caleb and Anusha, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, so I've got a question that I'd be interested in having each of you comment on. It has to do with the specific nature of the resolution. The resolution speaks of philosophy, uh, not policy or practice. And I'm curious, how can we know what a police department's philosophy is other than by looking at the policies it enacts or the practices that it engages in. And whatever you think of that, does it matter to who, to, to whether this resolution ought to be affirmed or not? I can go first on this one if you want. Um, with the idea of philosophy in policing, I very much agree that it is indeed ambiguous in how it applies and where we apply it and how we actually recognize it. Because philosophy is an intangible where these policies and these practices do generate those tangible impacts. My response to that though, is that these policies and these practices can't exist without the philosophy underlying it. So evaluating the philosophy does come somewhat from what we see in the practices and in the policies. And perhaps that's one of my biggest points of contention with Caleb's case as well, is this idea that we can't separate procedural reform from the philosophy because it's based on this philosophical shift saying something needs to change in how we engage in acts of violence that our on-site violence in our philosophy that is embedded in our system needs to change. And so for me, looking at philosophy, I look to the effectiveness of recognizing the combination of those rhetoric, what the rhetoric looks like, what we see with something like the 1970 war on drugs enactment, or I look to the policies enacted in response, the program 1033, which gave us the militarized weapons to police forces when it was completely unnecessary. And the fact that we are violating other policies that should be stood for, like the stand your ground law, which should have allowed Breonna Taylor her rights in a way where she wouldn't have lost her life. And finally, practice in the form that philosophy is dictating your course of thought and therefore your course of action. So what we see and how police practice is indicative of what they value the most. Um, Mr. Gilbertson, I love your question because I'm a bit of a philosophy buff myself. And uh, I'm reminded of, um, there was a Dutch philosopher named Spinoza and he wrote a bunch on ethics, a bunch on philosophy. And finally, toward the end, at one point, he says it basically means nothing. And I don't think philosophy means nothing, but I think what we need to understand about philosophy is it's to a certain degree devoid of everyday action. And what it is, is it's a generalization, right? It's not taking the individual actions of every day, but it's taking a step back from things and saying, how does this work long term? And I think the reason this is such an important understanding is because right now we can get so caught up in video clips and what we're seeing on the news and almost a hysteria, but we can take a step back and say, okay, what has really guided our, our philosophy thus far? And I think that what you see is when you do the comparative analysis, when you look at how hard it is to get a functioning society, a functioning law enforcement, that's not completely corrupt. I mean, we clearly have our problems, but we on balance have a very good system despite its many kinks. So I think philosophy kind of lends us in that direction. Do you mind that's if true. I respond to that particular answer? Uh, it's above my pay grade here, but I'm fine with it. Fair is fair. So you get one rebuttal as well. All right. So I don't disagree with the notion that philosophy isn't inherently what we can look to as the sole explanation. But where I do disagree is the fact that philosophy does in fact influence our everyday actions. Because everything I do, in my mind, is dictated by the values I hold closest to me. 
I will avoid speaking poorly on my family because family is one of my closest values. It's one of my core beliefs to protect the name of my family and more importantly, the people in my family out of care and out of love. And that is part of my philosophy. And so that dictates how I act, how I speak about them and how I will interact in regards to them. And so that to me is that reference that we understand philosophy influences where police think the problem lies. And that's what we could see in Las Vegas with those isolated incidences and those procedural reforms is we identify that because there was a problem in how they were thinking previously. And that is by nature part of your philosophy. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We're gonna remove put you back in as an audience member. And next I'm going to invite Nancy Fairbank to join us on stage. Nancy, please join us. Hi, can everyone hear me? You both are doing so well. Uh, so Kayla, my, my first question is for you. And as a self-proclaimed person that loves philosophy, you may have read about Jeremy Bentham's panopticon idea. Uh, but when you're discussing how we can have predictive policing, uh, specifically through AI, that will involve probably the collection of a lot of data that may rely on increased surveillance measures like cameras in neighborhoods, uh, things of that nature. And you talked about government regulation earlier, but the government has also had serious problems with uh, collecting citizens' data in a non-privacy secure and very privacy invasive way, as we've seen, for example, with the NSA. So how are you going to ensure the collection of data that drives your predictive policing model is not going to itself violate the civil liberties and rights of citizens? Yeah, no, this is, uh, I mean, very right at the heart of the case. And I think the way we need to understand this is actually in a broader historical context. And we're crossing into a whole new domain in human living. I mean, you think about the industrial revolution, right? We're kind of in this technological revolution. And there's a whole new set of questions that need to be answered that are going to be much more long winded than what we're looking at now, predictive policing. But when I looked at specific kind of legislation options and what the state is able to do, what I found is that when the state, when there's a separation between the, um, the companies and the state, that's where data is most safely protected because a lot of these data scandals have occurred when the government and businesses kind of get in bed together, right? And they're intertwined and they're using the data from private companies to spy on their citizens. I think that, for instance, you'll see a lot of pop-ups when you're on Instagram or on an ad. It's like, hey, or we're not using your data or do we have permission, right? So I think that keeping those institutions separated so the government is able to act on a check for um, the, th the third party institutions is our best method of keeping it safe. Even if the government is not perfect with it, it's our best option at the moment. Thank you. Awisha, so you would talk about sort of bigger problems in the system. And, and one example that you give is the war on drugs. But because this topic is specifically about police departments, Obviously, police departments are limited in what they can do when lawmakers might be the ones uh, leading things like the war on drugs and making what we could argue to be unjust or racially biased laws, like the difference in sanctions uh, between crack versus cocaine. So when lawmakers are making these sort of arguably unjust laws, uh, with police departments working under your proposed philosophical shift, what do they do in those cases? Should they enforce those laws? that might be unjust? Or would you argue that under your philosophical shift, they should take another course of action? Yeah, so firstly, to be blatantly honest, I think philosophical change shouldn't just occur at the level of police force. That is the scope at which I'm debating. But if I were to have this conversation anytime, the number of changes necessary in terms of how we have created a prison industrial complex and a military industrial complex where the criminal justice system has been coined the modern plantation by Brady Heiner, I look to the fact that a lot of widespread change is necessary in these mindsets. But within police reform, that's when I then go back to that idea of how philosophy has changed already. And this is something that I've talked about multiple times in the debate already, which is we've went away from this idea of serving the public and this idea of community-based police relations as our philosophy. And with the war on drugs, it moved towards becoming the law enforcer, when in fact the role of police should be more to serve the community. Because with the idea of maintaining order and being the law enforcer, that's when those biases trickle in that the law has been used, especially as a justification method for it. And with the war on drugs, it was the rhetoric that police followed before the laws were even there. 
and before the laws were even present that led to an ability to figure out what laws would be best to then create the problem we see today with the war on drugs. And that's where there's an issue of how philosophy has even influenced policy and it's influenced the changes in structure at a wider scale, which is why I argue that police really need to prioritize serving the public, especially when we look at a case like Elijah McClain, who was a neurodiverse member of a community and he was even called in reported as someone who was nonviolent and was not doing anything related to criminal activity. Yet this concept of enforcing law and maintaining order is what led police to feel that they could escalate to violence immediately based on this implicit bias that he is described as a black male, rather than recognizing that the philosophy that they should be addressing is they were called in this case to do the part of their responsibility that is social work and they should have treated it as such. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Nancy. We're going to move you back to as an audience member. And we are going to bring up our final judge for the evening, our Chief Learning Officer, Tony Penny. Tony, please join us on stage. Okay, can I unmute myself? Uh, nice to see you. First of all, I just want to compliment you both on just a, a stunning final round. Uh, you guys have been working hard all day, and I uh, appreciate it and am uh, delighted at what I've seen so far, uh, just in, in terms of how you've constructed your arguments. My first question is going to be for Anwisha. Um, and if you forgive me, my, my background is in fiction writing. So my undergrad degree was in, in, in fiction writing. And so I'm really interested in the idea of narrative. So I want to kind of run with what you're proposing here and, and your side, the affirmative here, and say that, okay, let's assume that police departments make this shift, as you say they must, uh, and a decade from now, um, so that they are better protecting civil rights. And so in, in this world, 10 years down the road, 15, 20, however long it might take, because we know reform takes quite some time, what does a police department that better protects civil rights look like? You know, what are the impacts and how would what we see read or read about in a newspaper 10, 15, 20 years from now be different from what we're seeing today? For starters, I think that there needs to be a division of understanding of the task force. In the local scale, what we see is the same general police officers are the first responders for social work, like a call on potential problems with mental health for someone who might be in a completely nonviolent situation. And those same police officers are also called for a potential murder threat. What happens there is when we look to how police training exists today, Almost all systems, which are also very short training systems, really only train to the worst case scenarios where police lives are put to stake. And when we look at positive media attention with even film and shows and how narratives have shaped this idea of what the police can be, they've been given this essential hero complex such that they have to stop the villain. And the villain has become almost every citizen, unfortunately, but especially African-American citizens in the narrative that's been twisted. Um, Ehrlichman has a direct quote where he says they couldn't make it illegal to be black. So instead, they made it illegal to have drugs and associated blacks with drugs. And that's where the problem really lies. He says, um, quote, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be black, but by getting the public to associate blacks with drugs and then criminalizing heavily, we could disrupt those communities and we could vilify them night after night. Did we know we were lying? Of course we did. End quote. And that's where my issue with this idea of crafting the narrative really lies and why the philosophy truly is so powerful. So when I look to the transformation, I look to this idea that legitimate training on racial biases and implicit biases are trained for. The expectance that there is a separate training system for mental health and a separate unit for mental health and social work such as homelessness. That there's accountability in the police force where Quite frankly, qualified immunity isn't something that can be used to justify the freeing of people in murder cases, such as in the case of George Floyd, or the lack of arrest thereof for a case like Breonna Taylor's. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and my question for Caleb is along the same line. So let's, let's assume looking 10, 15, 20 years into the future that, uh, you know, your, your side of the argument is that uh, police don't necessarily need to embrace a philosophical shift. What they need to embrace is a procedural shift. Um, so what does that look like, you know, if they embrace these new procedures that you're talking about, predictive policing, um, you know, are some of these inequities that we're seeing in, in what policing looks like now, are they solved merely by shifting procedures? Yeah, I think um, I, I, re I return to the quote I brought up of Christian Gall, who brought up that the way that he found out how to fix racial disparities in a community 
was by focusing on the procedures that get them there, right? And that's because when we take these example work forms, when you change the way that an officer is interacting with the suspect, you're changing the outcome. And I think that's kind of the direction um, that this is going to be pushed. And I think it's going to bring a, around a whole new wave of due process protections, right? Because I'm noticing when I was studying the procedural reforms, it's all about slowing it down, right? So the first officer to get to the foot chase, his adrenaline is, you know, it's bumping. He's going to want to just tackle and it's going to lead to force. It's slowing it down. The chokeholds rather than, I mean, that's on some level a human instinct, you know, just throw it around someone's neck, but it's slowing it down to make sure that the suspects that are being dealt with are being protected. So I think we're going to see us move in a direction with more due process protections. And if the evidence continues in its way, I think crime is going to begin to go down further as well. Excellent. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. We are going to move you back into our audience. All right. Now we will move into the final two speeches of the evening. Debaters, one you have given your closing statement. I'm going to invite Tony to come back up on camera and we are going to begin our awards presentation. So to our other 14 debate national finalists that were in the audience uh, at this time, make sure that you are camera ready, uh, ready to be called up on our virtual stage and that your family member or mentor is present with you to pin you ceremoniously on camera. Uh, to Caleb and Amwesha, good luck with your final speeches. Thank you. I'm going to take two minutes of my prep time starting now. All right, I will begin whenever you say you're ready, Caleb. I'm ready when you're ready. Okay, let's begin time now. I'll admit, I should strike people as a person who'll never be satisfied because perhaps I never will. But I don't think that's a bad thing and I especially think that's important to this debate is the clarity of how we can start truly working to that quote unquote perfect standard. Hamilton was quoted to be never satisfied because of this idea that he needed to perfect the construction of the treasury or get as close as he could, or he'd never have the popular support behind it. And on that same basis, maybe I should go back to Hamilton. Angelica Schuyler in the musical says that when I meet Thomas Jefferson, I'm gonna compel him to include a woman in the sequel in regards to the Declaration of Independence. Why? Because the philosophy behind it was poor and wrong in that it didn't treat equality at utmost importance. And so long as we agree that police philosophy as it exists today doesn't put equality at its utmost importance, police will act in a way where they aren't forced to prioritize equality, no matter how many procedural reforms we make. But secondarily, almost every procedural reform we look to is still heavily dependent on the idea that the philosophy changes along with it. Las Vegas, you can't separate different procedural reforms and say what's attributed to what, because all of those collectively changed how police think about how they can act. When we looked to Las Vegas, we saw that they had implicit bias classes and they had seven different procedural reforms enacted at the same time that my opponent's talking about. When we mm -hmm. look to predictive policing, we look to the fact that we are taking data that was built by a philosophy that's biased. We are taking mm -hmm. data from what exists already in police force. And when we take the criminal data that exists, when African Americans are arrested at six time higher rate for crimes they are just as likely to commit, we know that there's going to be bias in the data. And we know that it's like putting too much flour in a cake. It's never gonna come out right. Or putting too much baking soda. And it just tastes awful. Yes, maybe a little bit is good, but not so much. And not predictive policing when we look to how it violates the rights of privacy 
how it violates our basic Fourth Amendment rights because there's no warrant involved in taking our data, how it violates our Fourth Amendment rights because ICE was allowed to use predictive policing to create a national surveillance system in which they find people with legally obtained documents, detain them, and in many cases even deport them despite it being legal. These cases aren't cases in which we're seeing positive change. If African Americans are labeled gorillas by the predictive policing tech, we cannot trust it. And no technology exists to this day that has racial equitability in predictive mm -hmm. policing. Maybe in the future, but the only way we get there is by fixing the data. And the data is fixed by the philosophy, by the mindsets of police on who they ought to arrest. Because otherwise, we can repair an oven, but until we get all the ingredients just right, the cake won't come out good. So we have to change the philosophy. Um, I'm going to run. I don't believe I've used any prep time. So I'm going to go ahead and run my three minutes, if that's all right. Two. Two, two minutes. My, my apologies. Final speech in my debate career. So, is everyone ready? Or I guess it's just you and Risha. You ready? All right, let's get started. Well, to cut to the chase, on Risha and I both agree about a lot. There's a lot of problems that need to be fixed, but that's about all we agree on because from there, it's a question of how do we best reform it and get there. Law enforcement, they stand right on these fault lines of deep racial divides. And we need to keep in mind both how marginalized communities have been affected, but also that law enforcement is a stakeholder here. We need to look to the evidence and see where it leads us in best defending civil rights. And I'm reminded of a famous proverb of the tortoise and the hare. And you know, it's, it's an interesting example because you look at the hare and the hare is so caught up in the moment. It's, it's quick, it's running fast, and it's it's almost this hubris of like, you can just run through everything and go quick. But then you have the tortoise who's taking it slowly. And, 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 and it's famously said that the wheels of justice move slowly, but inevitably it gets there and it's gonna get us to the goal. And I think that's the question of today. Who best protects civil rights? And with all due respect to Anwisha, I think aside from burning the system down, we haven't really heard how rights are gonna be protected in this new world. Even when she was asked directly in questioning, that what was brought up was a mental health unit, which I think is actually a very interesting proposal and something that could be looked into. But how is that protecting civil rights? And instead, I'd invite America, because this is, at the end of the day, as I look out into our current state and how things are being politicized by both the right and the left, Americans need, Americans need the answers, right? How are we really going to see reform? How is my situation going to be bettered? And I think the evidence directs us in two directions to return to my original case. First is procedural reform. We need to change the interactions with police officers and those they're with. And even if you say, you know, with the Las Vegas study, there's too many confounded variables, you know, fair enough. But then you can look to Dallas and then you can look to New York and then you can look to the 20 other municipalities that are adopting this and see a general trend going in the right direction. That Americans can solve these issues bit by bit. 
Or you can look to the predictive policing, which I, I understand that there's nuance there and it's not a foolproof system, but I said nothing's the silver bullet. But predictive policing has the evidence that the sociologists pointed out, that why are urban cities doing better since the 90s? Because rather than going in with bias, officers are able to sit back and use more objective methods. Yes, the data can be skewed, but the data is updated in the system, right? The evidence is directing us to see that civil rights can be empirically better defended when we look to procedural reform and we look to predictive policing. And, you know, it's funny. I think, um, uh, I think Anwisha made an interesting point when she went back to the Declaration of Independence to say, you know, it needs an updated. And I think that's always something true. But I think what Ronald Reagan understood, not to incite him in his debate, but of conservative wisdom is that a lot of the answers to our problems can be found in the past. And for all the Declaration of Independence problems, it is one of the most beautiful political documents that's been produced. It's what's given America this mantle to speak about rights and equality. And that's the philosophy we're using. That's the base of the present status quo. And it's off of the back of the Declaration of Independence that we're going to get the changes that we need. Thank you all. Good debate, right. Caleb. Good debate, Anwisha. Thank you, debaters. I know that you have been on camera with us for almost 11 plus hours. Uh, it has been an incredibly long day and a grueling battle as you've made your way here to the top. We are going to keep everyone in suspense just a little bit longer while we wait for our judges to wrap up their votes. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and move both of you back into the audience, give you a little bit of time to adjust off camera. <laughs> uh, you can kind of use your cheeks right here to, to strengthen your muscles that are probably starting to ache. <laughs> and we're going to recognize each of the debaters and the national finalists that have joined us today for their hard work and their achievements. So we're going to move both of you into the audience. And at this time, I'm also going to bring up our Chief Learning Officer, Tony Penny. There we go. All right. Sorry, just pulling up my, trying to submit my ballot and get ready for our award ceremony here. <laughs> Excellent. So after a full day of competition, it is time to properly recognize each of our national qualifiers. Uh, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to read your names and we're going to call you up to the virtual stage. And then we're going to ask you to introduce the family member or mentor that is with you and ask them to pin onto the official Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute pin, much like the one that I'm wearing right here. Uh, then our team is going to take a photograph of you and the family member. So my colleague from behind the scenes is going to direct us through this process. So we're going to start off our first level of scholarships. So the uh, first eight debaters today are going to walk away with $750 in scholarships for the university of their choice. In no particular order, we're going to start with recognizing our first debater, Adam Hamden. Adam is a recent graduate from Jackson High School in Canton, Ohio, and will be attending Georgetown University in the fall. So Adam, please come up and join us. Hi there. Looks like Adam. Hey, Adam, how's it going? And uh, who, who's joining you tonight to uh, do the pinning? Um, unfortunately, like none of my family could come tonight um, just due to a ton of scheduling conflicts. But so I'll be doing it, I guess. Well, there you go. Well, use utmost caution. These things are sharp and we wouldn't want you to hurt yourself. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, that looks wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam, and congratulations. And we're going to take a picture here in just a second. All right, Adam, in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations, Adam. All right, next up we have Arnav Palawal. Arnav is a rising senior from Amity Regional High School in Woodbridge, Connecticut. Congratulations to Arnav. I 
There we go. And Arnav, if you could join us on screen. Oh, here comes Arnav. How's it going, Arnav? And if you could join us and uh, you could unmute yourself. And uh, do you have anyone who's uh, able to join you to uh, pin the pin on you? I have my uh, little brother. Oh, fantastic. What's your little brother's name? Uh, his name is Armand. Armand? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Nice to meet you, Armand. All right. Well, you have the honor, sir. Are you going to pin that onto your brother? that the brotherly love and attention to detail it's wonderful excellent so armand if you could stand next to your brother for the photo all right gentlemen in three two one click thank you so much congratulations arnav thanks thank for joining you. us armand <laughs> Excellent. Next up, coming to our virtual stage will be Asher Gladstone. Asher graduated this spring from Syosset High School in Syosset, New York, and will be attending Williams University this upcoming year. So Asher, please feel free to join us on our virtual stage. Congratulations, Asher. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And who have you brought with you uh, tonight to pin this on? Uh, this is my mom next to me to uh, present the pin. Um, but also, I think her camera's off. But also, here is my uh, my speech and debate coach, uh, Mrs. Esslinger. Um, oh, Mrs. Esslinger, if you want to turn your camera on, we'll we'll say hi to you as well. So let's go ahead and, and mom, uh, we'll let you uh, have the honors. Okay. Oh, All fantastic. right, everyone, big smiles in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much, Asher and Bama. Yeah, Thank you. congratulations. All right, and coming up next to the virtual stage will be Aubrey Weiberg. Aubrey attended Thales Academy, Rollsville High School in Rollsville, North Carolina, and will be heading to the University of Dallas in the fall. And while we're bringing her up to the stage, I also want to give a shout out to my colleague, Rebecca, who right now is managing everything behind the scenes. She's pulling up slides. She's bringing people up to the stage. She's taking them back down to the stage. A woman of many talents. So thank you, Rebecca, for all you're doing to make this happen tonight. Hello. Hey, Aubrey, and who, who do you have with you tonight? This is my mom. Excellent. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, great. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll let you go ahead and do the honors, Mom. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Looks great. Nice work. Uh, and I think we're all going to smile now. All right, if everyone smiles big in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Yeah, congratulations, Aubrey. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Ethan Zhang. Ethan is a rising senior at Seven Lakes High School in Katy, Texas. Uh, so Ethan, please come on down and join us on stage. Yeah, and for those of you who are out there waiting, you don't have to actually click anything or do anything. Rebecca does all the work for you and brings you up on stage. So Ethan, come on down. Excellent. Welcome, Ethan. And who have you brought with you this evening? Uh, this is my wonderful mom. Oh, nice. Look at that. Hi, mom. Nice to meet you. Wonderful mom is uh, Ethan. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic. Thank so, you. Wonderful mom. Go ahead and uh, you can do the honors. Okay.
Fantastic. Looks great. All right, everyone, smile big in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank Congratulations, you. Ethan. Thank you. All right, so coming up next to our virtual stage will be Graham Litz. Graham will be a junior this upcoming year at Joel Barlow High School in Redding, Connecticut. So Graham, feel free to join us on stage. Excellent. How's Hello. it going, Graham? And who do you Hi. have with you this evening? Uh, I have my mom. Hi there. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And we'll go let you go ahead and uh, put the pin on Graham. Okay, thank you. Do enjoy the artwork in the background as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to take the picture now. All right, smile big in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Congratulations. All right, uh, coming up next to the virtual stage will be Katie Lynn. So Katie is a rising junior from Carroll Senior High School in South Lake, Texas. So Katie, come on down and join us. While we're doing that, I'm also going to shout out Megan Gately, who's working in the chat room for us this evening, trying to keep it engaging for everyone. Nice work in there, Megan. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm good. And who have you brought with you this evening? I'm my mom. Hello. Uh, hello. How are you doing? <laughs> Thanks for joining us and for watching the final round. We'll let you go ahead and, and put the pin on Katie now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Also goes to note, Tony, that Katie is a legacy uh, great communicator national finalist as her sister Anna Lynn was a finalist a few years back. So great walking in her footsteps, Katie. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. In three, two, one, click. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so Thank much. You. Congratulations. All righty. So coming up next to the virtual stage will be Zachary Hines. Zachary graduated from West High School in West Bend, Wisconsin, and is attending the University of Wisconsin in the fall. Rebecca, correct me if I have this wrong. Zachary has strong opinions on Kringle. Is that correct? Yes, Zachary backed up the, the Wisconsin Kringle is superior. Excellent, excellent. It's actually uh, Madison, not West Bend, but they oh. call both high schools West High School, so I can understand how it's confusing. Oh, okay, well, Madison, there we go. So Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, so, and Zachary, who have you brought with you this evening? Oh, uh, my mom. Your mom, hello, how are you? Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, go ahead and uh, place the pin. All right. Fantastic. Congratulations. All right. And big smiles in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Yeah, congratulations, Zach. Thank you. All right. So now those are our uh, eight $750 scholarship winners. The next four debaters all made it to the quarterfinal round uh, or the top eight of today's competition and they'll each be walking away with $1,500 in scholarships. Uh, so in no particular order, uh, our first person will bring up Aaron Ravine. Aaron recently graduated from Stanford High School in Stanford, Connecticut, and will be attending Yale University in the fall. Aaron is also no stranger to this competition uh, and is our defending national champion. So congratulations, Aaron. Good to see you again, Aaron. Hi, Anthony. Hi there. And uh, go ahead and tell our audience who you got with you tonight. This is my mom, Anna. Good to see Hi. you again. <laughs> and uh, go ahead and uh, you, can, you can put the pin on Aaron. Nicely done. <laughs> All right, and smile big in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Yeah, congratulations, Aaron. Thank you. 
All righty. Coming up next to the virtual stage will be EJ Roram. EJ was homeschooled in Plano, Texas, finishing his senior year this year. And in the fall, he is heading off to Southern Methodist University. Well, SMU, home of one of our sister presidential libraries, the uh, George W. Bush Presidential Library is on campus there at SMU. So hopefully uh, EJ will get a chance to visit that if he hasn't already. <laughs> so, and EJ, who have you brought with you this evening? I brought my mom. Uh, she's, you know, I credit her with, with helping me get here, honestly. She's been very helpful, just kind of fielding ideas, helping me with debate pretty much since I got into speech and debate, so... And, and mom, question for you, is it, is it fun to have a, a, a son who is uh, inclined and really talented at debate, or does that make mothering even tougher? Oh, of course. Lots of arguing. <laughs> Lots of arguing. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead and uh, place the pin on. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Looks great. All right, big smiles in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Fantastic, congratulations. Thanks. All right, and uh, coming up next to the virtual stage will be Eugene Kong. Eugene is a rising senior at Seven Star in Hacienda Heights, California. While we're bringing Eugene up. I also want to shout out Whitney Pagan, Whitney, who makes all of our events, whether they are in person or digital, happen. She's working hard behind the scenes. Nice work today, Whitney, and always. Um, all right. Yeah, can, you, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. How's it going, Eugene? And who do you have with you today? Um, yeah, I'll just let you guess, you know, going with the running tradition. <laughs> yeah, there seems yeah, to be I, a lot of moms who are coming. Yeah, out. I know. There, there is. So, yeah, I brought my mom. There we go. Oh, fantastic. Well, Bob, go ahead and uh, feel free to put the pin on Eugene. Yeah. All right. Oh, fantastic. Looks right good. Looks good. And uh, we'll go ahead and take the picture. Nice t-shirt, Eugene, as well. Thanks for repping your debate t-shirt. All right. And three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Nice work. Thank you very much. Congratulations. All right, and coming up next to the virtual stage, we have Joshua Hansen. Josh will be a senior this year at Jackson Hole Community School in Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, so Josh, come on up and join us. I also want to give a shout out to Chris Adams. Chris, formerly one of our regional partners, has come on board this year to make this program happen for us. Chris, you are fantastic, and you have turned this into one of our greatest competitions we've ever had, so nice work. Like Josh is coming up on screen. No. Oh, no. Oh, we can hear you, Josh. <laughs> you know, this works for months and months, and then. <laughs> when you need it, you it. Uh... Well, we'll give, you a, we'll give you a second here, and if it uh, doesn't pop up, we can, uh, we'll just, you can, you can describe what you look like to us, and we'll picture it in our minds. <laughs> Uh, and, and Josh, who do you have with you to present you with the pin this evening? Uh, I've got mom right next to me and then dad's off to the side. Uh, oh, fantastic. And then two dogs on the floor that are not oh. happy about a thunderstorm outside. Oh, um, it, it looks like my camera has decided to disappear. <laughs> which right, is unfortunate. Well, I'm just going to ask our audience. I want you to picture mom. I want you to picture dad. I want you to picture two dogs and a thunderstorm. Just hold that image in your mind. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, you could you could put the pin on and, uh, you know, we'll try to bring you up back again later, but we'll say thank you. And thank congratulations. You. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Joshua. All righty. So our next two debaters made it all the way to the semifinal round of the top four of today's competition. And today they will each be walking away with a $2,250 scholarship to the university of their choice. Uh, first up, please welcome to the stage, Rashik Betty.
And while we're bringing Rashik up, I also want to say thanks to the rest of the team that has been working so hard on this behind the scenes today. Ruben, Tyler, Colleen. Uh, I know I saw you all in there messaging back and forth. So thank you for all your hard work all day long. And Rashik, who do you have with you? I have uh, my mom here and my dad is trying to scoot away. But yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. It's a family affair. Uh, let's go ahead and have you put the pin on. <laughs> Hi. Fantastic. Right. Dad, you can, you can scoot up in, in the picture. Right now we have half of your faces. <laughs> we, can, we can put three smiling faces on this. Thing. All right. And in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Uh, and then I'm going to go to Rebecca. So the, the order, the slide you brought up was different than the order I had here. I just want to make sure we're not pre-revealing any of the uh, information that's, uh, that's about to come after we announce these two. So the next one I have up is James. So our James Gao, recently graduated from Ridge High School in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and is heading to Duke in the fall. So James, congratulations. And while we're doing that, I also wanna give a big shout out to our interns who've been working all day today, Sarah, Jaden, Lauren. Uh, thanks for all your amazing work. We appreciate it. All right, James, who do you have with you? Oh, you're muted, James. I have both my mom and my dad since they couldn't decide which one of them wanted to be here. So. Oh, there we go. Well, you got to get those debate skills from somewhere, right? So it's okay. We can have them both in there. Split decision. Uh -huh. <laughs> so go ahead and uh, put the pin on. Excellent. All Big right. smiles. And in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. Well, we are down to the final two, but the suspense continues. We want to make sure we formally recognize each one of our top two debaters and individually invite them up on stage to be pinned. Before we announce the winner, I know the crowd is going wild. The votes are in. You want to see the results. It's election night, but we're going to delay that just a minute longer as we call up to the stage Anwesha Mukherjee. Anwesha graduated this year from Westview High School in Portland, Oregon, and is going to attend Stanford University in the upcoming year. So Anwesha, please join us on screen. And then let's see, we still have you muted, but who have you brought uh, with you tonight? I couldn't really pick a favorite, so I have both my mom and my dad. Oh, there we go. There we go. And I'm sure they're both very happy to be there. Hi, mom and dad. How are you? You must be very proud tonight. Uh, please go ahead and you can uh, put the pin on. Shout out to one of my coaches, Sarah Foster, who's hyping me up in the comments. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay, big smiles. All right, everyone, in three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I see Megan trying to cause problems down there in the chat asking who the favorite parent is. You can't give an answer to that one. You can never give an answer to that one. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, we want to recognize our final debater. Um, and we're going to bring on Wesha back up in a second to do our grand reveal. So we want to bring up Caleb Knox. Caleb recently graduated from First Colonial High School in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and will attend Patrick Henry College this upcoming year. So Caleb, please feel free to join us. Oh, and Caleb, you're still muted. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hey. And who have you got with you, Caleb? Uh, these are my role models. This is my dad, former debater himself. Uh, back in the day. Oh my gosh, I can only imagine family dinners. Yeah, <laughs> She's like a soccer mom but for debate. Um. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, congratulations to you both. Your, your son's done an excellent job. Uh, and uh, go ahead and uh, you can put the pin on. All right. <laughs> Trickier than I thought. Okay, there we go. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, and three, two, one, click. Thank you so much. 
Excellent. Okay, so we're going to, Caleb, you're going to stay up on screen and Rebecca is going to bring Onwesha back to the stage for our final announcement. Tony, before we do that, we wanted to make sure that the audience was able to participate as well. So we are actually going to launch a poll at this moment where the audience can cast their vote for who they felt was the next great communicator. And we're going to see if the popular vote will match the Electoral College today. Yes. Launching Excellent. Poll. I was just going to say, if this was American Idol, we'd be going to commercial right now, just to delay <laughs> it a little bit longer and keep the audience interested. So there's a, there's a poll that has popped up. Right, we have Caleb and Alesha, you can both vote for yourselves if you want. They actually can't. They're panelists, and panelists are not allowed to vote today. So I'm just lied to you, and I apologize. <laughs> right, we have 72% of the vote in. Just a few more seconds, and then we are going to close the polls. If a few of the, the remaining people could vote, because it's a very close debate right now. <laughs> That would be great. All right, 85%. And we're going to close the polls in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Well, the audience, I think, is going to showcase that this was a tough debate. We have 49% to 51%. Um, and Tony, I will let you do the, would you like me to share the results of the audience first? Or how would you like us to do it? Um, yeah, let's go with the audience first because we can delay just a little bit longer and, and cause our poor competitors to sweat it out just a second longer. <laughs> All right, based on the popular vote of those joining us in a very hairline debate of 49% to 51%, we are showing that Caleb potentially could be the next great communicator. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. All right, well, now the moment we've all been waiting for. The votes have been counted. The results are in. It is time to reveal the next great communicator in a vote that was not as close as the audience vote. In a 5-0 vote, the next great communicator and winner of the $5,000 scholarship grand prize is Anwisha. Congratulations. <laughs> So that means our runner up, Caleb, you win a $3,500 scholarship. Congratulations to you both. It was a fantastic final round. Thank you guys. Congrats. 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 That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's truly an honor just not only to our, to our finalists, our national finalists, but all of our debaters and their families. Uh, it's uh, such an honor to have you compete. Uh, we appreciate that in the year 2020, where so many things have uh, kind of gone awry, that you were able to join us and participate in this competition virtually. Uh, at some point, we hope to have you all out to the library uh, and, and to continue and to see you in person. Um, I'm going to invite our 2020 debaters and judges to sit tight. We're going to bring you up to the virtual stage to take a group photo and close out the competition in just a second. Uh, so guests, thank you for joining. Uh, stay well, good night, be safe. Uh, so Rebecca, if you could please bring up our five judges on stage for a quick photo with our two finalists. And then after that, we'll invite uh, the entire group up. <laughs> 